Well, good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are in the world. I'd like to welcome you all to this ISC uh, knowledge sharing session on the new frontiers of science communication. The ISC has uh, for a while now been keen to harness the energy of our members and affiliated bodies and broader networks to organize and amplify our key science messages for the international science community and indeed the public with misinformation unwittingly and sometimes deliberately shared online. Now more than ever, we need strong science communication and a group of science communica communicators who are cognizant of the latest technology on how to engage audience. Uh, and doing this through the use of compelling storytelling that shares knowledge and is a driver for action. My name is Alison Meston and I'm the Director of Communications with the International Science Council. Our vision is to advance science for a global public good and today I hope we will do just that as we explore the new frontiers of science communication with three very special guests. Before I introduce our guests, um, we'd love to see who's joined today's session and to get to know each other a bit better. So you, please feel free to post your name and organisation and position in the chat function on the right of your screen. I'd like to briefly hand you over to Anne, our membership officer, who will introduce our knowledge sharing sessions. Over to you. Alison, a very warm welcome to all of you. As Alison mentioned, my name is Anne and I act as the main focal point for all members of the International Science Council. And the ISC knowledge sharing series comprises an interactive, um, or comprises many interactive knowledge sharing sessions, at least one uh, per month we've been organizing and it was launched last year. It's particularly targeted at all staff members, office bearers, representatives of ISC members and ISC affiliated bodies in order to enhance knowledge sharing among the ISC membership and to strengthen the relationships within the ISC membership. If you have missed any of our previous sessions, you can access all of the recordings and presentations on our website. There's a link on the membership notice board, but you can also find the link in the chat now. I look very much forward to speaking to many of you during our dedicated and during the continued after event chats later on. Thanks, Alison, and back to you. Thanks, thanks, Anne, for that. And I, I, I really am appreciating the, the member engagement that the International Science Council is doing, and I hope we can continue um, these kind of sessions uh, in the future. Um, I'd like to bring in Jenya now, our Digital Media Officer, to speak about the new ISC Communications Network. Jenya, over to you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Anne, and thanks everyone for taking your time to join us today. Many of you have already received invitations to join the new limited IAC Science Communications Network, a community of science communications colleagues across the IAC membership, but also including people from friends and partner organizations of the IAC. So it's going to be quite diverse and global. And essentially, it's going to be a peer led email group where we can discuss ideas on better ways to communicate science, to network with each other, to amplify each other's messages and coordinate on the various campaigns. So we should essentially advance science as a global public good in a more effective and collaborative way. So if you haven't yet joined, you can do so by clicking the link that Anne has just posted in the session chat and we'll be officially launching the email group in the coming days. So expect to hear from us uh, soon. And I very much look forward to seeing you all there and uh, working with you in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jania. And a reminder that there is an opportunity to network online directly after the Q&A. If you haven't used Hopin before, it's a quite fun, uh, informal after event chat. Um, that, that tries to mimic an in-person event as we all we all learn to to go online during this uh, pandemic. So please stay if you wish to have a conversation with someone. So today we're going to hear from three speakers. We'll hear from uh, Anand Jagatia, a podcasting expert who will share his thoughts on the podcast as a powerful tool to build and strengthen audiences. Um, Anand, along with uh, the journal Nature and the ISC, has been recently working on a podcast series as part of uh, Nature's Working Science podcast on diversity in science. And perhaps uh, Anne or Genia can pop that in the chat now. 
We'll also hear from Joanna Strater, who I know very well from our time together at the World Association of Newspapers. Joanna has always been ahead of the game when it comes to audience engagement, and today is no different. She'll be bringing us into the Clubhouse, a new app currently available on Apple, but I'm sure we'll have applications for Android in the future, so I'm looking to finding out about that. And current, um, finally, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Robert uh, Lepenis, a member of the Global Young Academies Executive uh, Committee. The Global Young Academy is actually a proud member of the ISC, and Robert will be taking us through TikTok. It's not just for funny japes and cat antics, it has a serious application for communications for science, uh, bringing your audience and promoting the public value of science for a generation of young people who contact, uh, who, con who uh, access content on mobile technology. So this session is being recorded and will be shared publicly afterwards. Uh, you will receive a link to the recording and other uh, relevant materials after the event. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll have about 25 minutes of Q&A with our speakers after their short presentations. Um, so feel free to keep your questions until then and ask them live. Let's get things underway with Anand. Anand, we're all quite familiar with, uh, with the chat, with the, with the podcast. Can I ask you to come in and share your uh, video? And there we go. Great, here he is. Uh, Anand's all very, you know, we're all very familiar with the podcast, um, but let's let's get some really, uh, uh, you know, interesting aspects from you and uh, please take it away. Cool, I'm just trying to share my screen. Um, so okay. do I Do I need to, because I've got a separate monitor. Um, okay. One second. Yeah, so once I click that, then... Jenya, yeah, do you want to come in and assist uh, Anand? Yeah. Would you like me to share uh, slides from my end? Um, yeah, so I've, I mean, I've got, I can get, um, I can get the, I can get them up, but I'm just wondering how to sort of switch to my other. Yeah, Anand, let's have Jenya share your, your, yeah, your, sure. your screens yeah. and we'll move forward. Thank you, Jenya. Great. Here we go. Brilliant. Uh, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, uh, thanks, Alison. Um, so I'm Anand. I work as a freelance uh, presenter and a multimedia producer. So I work in science mainly, and um, I make uh, films and animations. Um, but I also um, um, yeah, I also a lot of what I do is is, is in podcasting um, and, and and in radio. So I work on I work for the BBC. I make a show which goes out on the World Service. Um, and I also produce podcasts for various organisations, including recently working with the ISC and with Nature uh, on their series about diversity. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why are podcasts um, powerful? Well, uh, to my mind, it's because um, there are three reasons, really. The first one is because it, it's really immersive. Uh, audio is incredibly evocative. There's this uh, sort of cliche where it, in, in the industry I work in that radio is like TV, except the pictures are better. Um, and I think that's because even though radio is, is technically a blind medium, right, there's no there's no visuals. Actually, because you're tapping into someone's imagination, you can really transport them to, to new places and to new ideas. Uh, it's also intimate. So I listen to podcasts kind of on my own, wearing headphones, which is different to when I watch TV or, or you know, watch, watch a film. And so it feels like, you know, when I'm listening to a podcast that I really like, it feels like they're talking directly to me, like they're whispering into my ear. And sadly, that's well, obviously true. They're talking to, to you know, millions or thousands of people, but it feels like I have a personal connection with them. Um, the other reasons why I think it, it's really powerful is because it's impactful. So podcasting is obviously huge right now. Um, it's grown massively over just the last seven years since I've been working in, in, in the in the field. Um, so you get you get a wide impact, you can meet lots of people, but you can also have a quite a deep impact, I think, with each of those people. So I think people listen to podcasts often for quite a long time in a stretch, so maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. So you can actually uh, get into topics in quite a lot of detail and it allows for nuance. And also it's impactful because you can get a lot out for what you put in. Um, you actually for the lot of the tools that you use to, to produce podcasts today are, are free or, or cheap. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I've worked on lots of different podcasts um, over the last kind of, you know, five to seven years with different organisations that have uh, different requirements, different budgets, um, different needs. And so I thought I'd just share some of my experiences and the kind of some of the different strategies that um, people have, have, have adopted when I've been working with them. So the, the kind of low, the kind of lowest, um, the easiest kind of uh, way to, I think, to, to turn a podcast around is to piggyback off of other content. And this is something that I did at the Royal Institution when I used to work there. So the RI is a really kind of famous um, organization for, for putting on talks and lectures in person but they also had a very successful youtube channel um, and we wanted to kind of maybe reach new audiences um, and so we decided to also you know launch a podcast and so these were talks that we'd already we were already putting the talks on you already have kind of done the heavy lifting in terms of deciding that you're going to run an event and that you've booked the speakers um, but we wanted to serve a different audience so our youtube audience was really into physics and they didn't really respond to anything that wasn't really physics so we we put some of the talks that weren't in that sort of category on on our podcast stream and they did really well there um so the benefits are that it's it's easy it's kind of low-hanging fruit it's a quick win but obviously not everything is going to be suitable you know if it's a visual talk that leads a lot of slides uh, you're not going to be able to uh, turn it into a podcast and by definition you're kind of doing stuff that's already uh, happening so you're not going to you know win any awards or probably do anything groundbreaking the next level up from that i think is something that requires a bit more um, production and this is uh, sort of exemplified by a podcast i'm working on at the moment called the g word uh, which is um uh, produced by Genomics England. So in this podcast, the CEO of that organisation talks to people in the field. So scientists, politicians, families who are affected by, by rare genetic conditions. It's simple, but it's effective, right? Lots of podcasts are like this, just essentially two people talking and it can be really thoughtful. It can be really, uh, it can be deep, it, can, it allows for nuance. Um, and it's quite easy to produce relatively low cost as well. Um, the obviously the downside is they can be terrible, right? They can just be two people talking about something for a long time that no one cares about. So you have to have really, really interesting guests and really interesting speakers. So if that's something that your organization has access to, it could be something to look into. So next slide, please. So uh, the the next level up from that, I would say, um, is is something that requires a little bit more production still. Um, so this is something that might include multiple guests, might include um, multiple different stories. Perhaps you're telling one story through multiple perspectives with different angles, and you kind of use music and sound a bit more extensively. Um, and that's kind of what we did working uh, with the ISC to produce this podcast about diversity. Um, these have the potential, I think, to be more engaging. You can actually sculpt a narrative. You can actually tell a story over time uh, through different people's points of view. Um, and including different perspectives is exactly what we wanted to do with the diversity podcast. And so that's why it was really important. Um, does obviously require more work uh, technically because you've kind of got more, more audio um, going on, but also editorially, you need to decide how you're going to you know, tell that story and how you're going to synthesize all these messy, com you know, complex viewpoints into something coherent that people will listen to. Um, and then I won't talk too much about the kind of next level, but this is if you're a massive organisation that's kind of already got a media platform, you can make podcasts that are, you know, really, really powerful and really, really engaging, but you generally need lots of money to go to places and, you know, hire a team and, um, you know, need a lot of time. So um, that's the kind of thing that we do at the BBC. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a range of different uh, kind of approaches that I'm sure your organisation could probably you know, fit into somewhere along that line. I thought I'd just tell you a bit more about practically if you do decide to kind of you know, make a podcast yourself, what stuff you need to think about. So before you even get started, I think it's really important to think about your audience. Who are they? Are they kind of are they nerds and are they really, really into the kind of detail and, and the methodology of the science or are they do they not really know much about science at all? Are you trying to kind of make your, your subject more approachable? Obviously, you have to find compelling stories and people, people that are good talkers, you know, people that are good at interviewing. And also think about why this is a podcast, you know, why isn't this a blog post or a film? Think about the medium. Um, once you've decided on that, then you need to actually gather your material. So I think um, you can, first of all, start off by finding a good host. Uh, if you've got someone in your organisation who is passionate about the subject, knowledgeable, is good at interviewing, good at talking, you know, you might be able to use somebody in-house. If not, then you can think about hiring somebody. Um, Capture good sound. Uh, I mean, the pandemic, I think, has really shown over the last year that we can make pretty good sounding programmes from the comfort of our own homes. I mean, this is my studio at the moment. You can see I've got creative with some pillows um, and a little USB microphone and um, things like that can actually make your, your, your audio sound really, really good. Uh, I would also recommend if you are interviewing people over Skype, um, use, you know, use, use, your, use mobile phones, get them to record themselves remotely on a mobile phone uh, rather than relying on the Internet um, and the audio you can capture kind of natively in the app. Next slide, please.
Um, and then once you've got your material and you've recorded it, uh, you need to edit it. Editing isn't really optional. You have to be ruthless and cut what you don't need. Um, you know, be really think about what's really going to keep people engaged. There's lots of software that you can use. Um, Audacity is a free um, platform, it's free bit of software that runs on Windows and Mac. I use something called Reaper, which isn't free, but it's very cheap. I think it's about 40 quid for a personal license or for a charity. If your organization has Adobe, um, or has, sorry, Creative Cloud, you probably have access to Adobe Audition. Think about how you can use sound, maybe, you know, get some sound from a library that you like um, and use that effectively to keep people engaged. And then publishing, once you've actually edited it, you need to get it out there. So decide on a, re on a realistic release schedule and stick to it. So every week, every two weeks, if you can't do that, maybe just think about releasing a mini series. It's just, you know, eight episodes, six episodes so that you're not tied in kind of forever. Um, and uh, that's because audio doesn't really go viral, I don't think, in the same way as video. You can't just release one podcast and expect it to do really well. You have to build up an audience and you have to build up a back catalogue that people can explore. Um, and then think about the last two points are just thinking about whether you need to do everything yourself. You know, can you, as the ISC did, you know, work with a partner, so work with someone like Nature to get your message out there and tell your stories like that? Or can you collaborate with other organisations? You know, if you haven't got the, if you can't work with a massive uh, fish like Nature, are there other people in the space who you think do a good job? And, you know, could you work together to maybe you give them some free content and, you know, you get some of their subscribers? Um, so that's it, really. I'd say that it, it is possible to make a good po podcast in house. And um, if you're a science organisation, you don't need to spend lots of money. You can't obviously think throw it together you do need to put um some resources into it but um you know just think about these things and i'm sure you'll learn a lot and and uh, get your get your stories told thank you thank you anand and um you know there's lots of learning that we uh we have as an organization i mean the isc started podcasting doing it ourselves with a, a small uh organization and then we went to nature so um you know it's uh been an interesting learning curve for the isc as we put forward um these kind of new uh new technologies um thank you so much so i'm going to uh bring in joanna now joanna strater and uh you know, Clubhouse is a new trending social platform built around group voice chats, which is currently available exclusively in the App Store and is by invitation only. Um, and it has as one of its members, Elon Musk, who publicly invited Vladimir Putin for a yes. conversation in the vir virtual club. So, I mean, is Clubhouse the next big thing? Does your scientific organization need a room in the Clubhouse? Let's go to Joanna Strater, who is managing partner at KCQ to find out. Thanks, Joanna. Oh, it's so great to see you. It's so nice to see you, Alice. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's great to, to be here with you and uh, with this uh, unbelievable, cool bunch of people here. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the exchange with you in the next moment. So uh, my name is Joanna Streta. I'm uh, working at the intersection of communication, uh, media and marketing. I have like almost 20 years experience with different industry internationally and uh, I, love so one of my hobbies is to test new platforms social media and clubhouse is one of them so um what i will do now i will start sharing my presentation with you and i hope i manage i hope you can see it otherwise please stop me anna yes, it looks good okay can, yeah, can you see but no, we cannot see it now, but we could see it briefly uh, a moment ago. Would you like me to share your presentation from my screen? I, I think I can manage to do it. Just okay. one second. I pressed the wrong button, Xenia. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead once again. This is what happens when you test new platforms. Sometimes you press the wrong button. Now. Can you see it now, I suppose? Yes, right. It's not right. in the presentation mode, so we can see the slides on the left. Um, yeah, now it's, now it's perfect. Yes, thank you, Anna. <laughs> sure, my pleasure. Okay, so shedding light on the mystery of Clubhouse, we are going to talk about this as uh, Clubhouse is uh, a quite recent platform. So not the fact. Um, so Clubhouse is an invitation-only audio chat for iPhone for the moment. Uh, it was launched last year in April uh, 2020. Um, so it's um, 
barely one year old. It's still in beta. Uh, the founders are Paul Davison and Rowan Seth of Alpha Exploration. And um, the what is it about? Um, Clubhouse facilitates auditory communication for groups of a few individuals. So you can have a group of two, three, four, five up to 5,000 people. As far as I know, um, when uh, Elson mentioned that Elon Musk invited uh, Vladimir Putin uh, to join a clubhouse talk, uh, I think they broke the uh, 5,000 people um, limit. And what Clubhouse says about themselves, that they are a new type of social product based on voice that allows people everywhere to talk, tell stories, develop ideas, deepen friendships, and meet interesting new people around the world. Yeah. So um, these are some facts. On the right side of the, my slide, you can see my profile. So uh, you have to get used to it. It took a while for me uh, to see just a picture of the uh, person um, that you're interacting with uh, uh, when you're interacting with it. So um, you can you can have your profile like in the most social media uh, networks. You can see my name. You can see the followers. You can see how many following people I'm following. I have a little description of my uh, profile and media marketing communication at the core of my activities and so on. I linked here my Twitter account uh, because it's a business account. I did not link Instagram because it's private for me. So I, I definitely plan to use Clubhouse for business. And of course, um, a very important point in, in, in Clubhouse is you, you have to be invited to join and you have to be an iPhone user. So I, I was I joined in, in January. The hype in Germany started in, in, in January 2021 and I was nominated by one of my um, partners. And to tell you the truth, the hype started uh, in Germany uh, a week before I was invited. And uh, there is something like uh, the fear of missing out. Yes, the FOMO. Uh, if you're in marketing and communication, of course, you want to join the conversation everywhere. And I had the fear that I will not be invited. It did not happen. I was invited. I was very happy, but it was really a little bit crazy. People were buying invitation to Clubhouse on eBay. So um, later on, I will tell you uh, more about how you can get an invitation. Um, let's talk about uh, who is on Clubhouse. So um, the numbers are, they say there are uh, about 10 million users. It's a lot of celebrities. It's uh, uh, in USA. Uh, the the hype started long long time ago. I think we don't have any participants from USA at this uh, time of the day. But uh, I'm sure we would have there um, more heavy users um, in in uh, Germany and in Europe. Um, the hype started um, earlier this year. So we have Oprah, Elon Musk, Ashton Kutcher, they are hosting chats and you have the possibility to hop in there and, and maybe <laughs> just ask your question, yes. So there are a lot of influencers, a lot of brands uh, and, and businesses that uh, are on Clubhouse. And on the right side, on, on, on my slide, you can see uh, my uh, use of, of uh, Clubhouse when I'm a passive user. So I, I really go and, and take a look at the, the social media show or uh, the top tech stories and so on. Uh, how to use Clubhouse? It's very easy. It's uh, uh, quite intuitive. Uh, you can switch from room to room. You can take part in discussions. Uh, um, you can think of um, a Clubhouse as a panel or an interactive podcast actually it's great for networking it is great for learning it is great for informal discussions um and and you have a huge array of of of, of topics that you can talk about we will um, talk about that uh, a little bit later so um, on the right side you can see one of the rooms because you can 
join a conversation in the so-called room and this was a room that was not um, started by myself but by some people I follow and they follow me and the talk was about uh, influencer in corporates and you can see on, on the right side of the slide on the upper part of the screen um, were um, the moderators with a green um, dot and the other one were their um, invited speakers. So the upper part is for the speakers. And then uh, the lower part, you can see the people that are uh, followed by the speakers. And more below, uh, below um, you can see uh, the other ones, uh, the other participants. So this is how, what a room looks like. And um, you, can, you can raise your hand. Uh, you can see a, a hand on the uh, uh, right, my right um, side, low side, um, and you can raise your hand and you can show like that, that uh, you want to talk, you want to ask your question. And that means for the moderator that they can take you in in, uh, in the upper part uh, with the speakers and there you can ask your question. It was uh, a little bit for me uh, difficult to get used to the fact that most of the people are um, with the first name in there. Sometimes I don't know the first name of all my contacts, uh, but um, you get used to that. And it's, it's just the picture and, 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 and the first name. And uh, um, you can hop in and stay there for two minutes. It happens sometimes when I think, okay, the, the, the discussion is not so, not so interesting for me. And then you can uh, leave quietly. Uh, how to get an invitation to Clubhouse? Yes, you cannot join Clubhouse without an invite, but uh, um, you, uh, if you're an iPhone user, you can download the app and reserve your username. And, and friends and contacts that are on Clubhouse see you on the waiting list and let you in. Um, they plan to, Clubhouse plans to expand to the general public soon. I heard, um, today also that they are planning in around four months time to have the android user joining in and they want um they they say they want to build community slowly and want to prepare features that will help um clubhouse handle larger numbers of people yeah they say they are building clubhouse for everyone and working to make it available to the world as quickly as possible as um, i said at the beginning they are still in beta so, but I have a, a, a nice offer for you, for the ones of you who are curious about Clubhouse and want to test. Uh, I can offer a three invitation to Clubhouse. Uh, I just need an email with your uh, mobile phone number. You can send it at my uh, email address uh, that you can see here on the slide, also in the uh, exhibition. I think you, you have access to it. Um, and, um, you need to be an iPhone user. So just let me know and I'm very happy to invite you to Clubhouse. Now, uh, is it relevant for uh, for you, Clubhouse? I, I would say absolutely, because uh, strong science communication, as Alison said at the beginning, it's essential for the, moment in the world of, of fake news. Yeah, uh, so um, it is so important, I think. Um, as you can see here, that this is um, um, uh, analysis a little bit older from February. Um, it's a lot of sales uh, on the topics, uh, social selling, uh, a lot about social media, uh, a, a lot of tech startups mainly. So I, I meet a lot of startup CEOs uh, um, um, that uh, are our own. Um, on, on clubhouse businesses brands uh women talk uh music mental health influencers these are the top topics but there is by far more than this so um i, I saw rooms on space economy on space law i didn't even know that something like space space law exists about climate about economics about uh life about parenting about dating you can use clubhouse for business you can use it for an organization you can use it for yourself so there are meditations rooms in the morning and in the evenings that's uh, so you can use it in, in so many ways. It's just fantastic. Actually, you can tap into, into 
the knowledge of the world and, and join the discussion on the topic you are interested in. Yeah, but the topics on this slide, they are the top topics that uh, uh, you can find on, on the, the, this moment on, on Clubhouse. Uh, what is new in Clubhouse, and, and this is very nice because they um, 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 experiment a lot. They created an accelerated program, and um, this is a Twitter um, message from the uh, founders. And they are launching a, a creator accelerator um, program and uh, they are looking forward to support and equip 20 creators. That's not a lot. That's worldwide with about 20,000 euro for each uh, to, to talk about uh, um, their ideas and then and, and bring uh, creativity in the show. And the, the nice thing is there, there are uh, club rooms that, where they um, just pitch ideas and the best, they, they want to select the best ideas to um, uh, to join this accelerator program and um, for example one of the ideas was um, to uh, um, make a cooking room and I, I thought what a cooking room just for audio is, is strange but um, actually uh, they said of course when you are on clubhouse you are free to move and this is what i why i love it because I, I i move a lot and and i can walk and i can move from here to there when i'm on clubhouse and, and talk to people um you can you can basically cook <laughs> while you use uh, uh clubhouse and you can get your uh instruction from a famous cook and there are people that are thinking about some sponsoring about it so there are ways also to monetize uh on on, on clubhouse of course uh, you, they are different usages. So um, how I use Clubhouse, uh, because I, I cannot call myself an expert, <laughs> I'm just uh, barely two, two months uh, using Clubhouse, but of course they are heavy users. I'm not one of them. I love it. I like it, but uh, I'm, I'm just testing. Yeah. So I, I use it a lot in a passive way. So I go into rooms and then I meet new people and, and um, I'm listening to, to, to what they want to share with us and I learn a lot yeah so this is the passive use uh, that it's always possible and and of course there is an active use of creating rooms and um i i decided so clubhouse is going to be for me mainly for business because i don't have the time for clubhouse leisure <laughs> um and uh, i started with partner so very important is when you when you are active on 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 clubhouse the partnership. So I started with with the, those guys that that you see below um, in the German speaking area, um, and and I asked uh, the question: Do I really need a room in Clubhouse? What does it bring for uh, uh, for marketing and communication? It was uh, mainly. And it was a very interesting discussion. It helps if you have influencers, if you have people that are known um, in your um, among your speakers, then you will get more uh, people joining um, your uh, your room. Um, of course, you have to decide for which topic to go. I decided uh, I, I, I go for the topic of content marketing and corporate newsroom because these are uh, the, the topics that I'm, I'm, I'm really focusing on uh, this year. So uh, that's why when I'm on Clubhouse, I, I work mainly on, on content marketing and um, corporate newsroom. And uh, um, what I do when I uh, um, have a room on Clubhouse, of course, I promote it everywhere uh, and mainly on, on social media. And uh, you can see here, this is uh, on the right side, my, my LinkedIn announcement for my uh, Clubhouse uh, uh, room. Yeah. So uh, this is what I do mostly with Clubhouse. And uh, um, if you are thinking about starting uh, um, an account on Clubhouse, you, you have to have a few <laughs> thoughts on that. Of course, if you have the resources for that, uh, what would be your uh, personal goal or, or the organization goals? Because um, you have to know as everywhere in social media, um, people and influencer um, are more authentic than organizations themselves. So they, they are not so many organizations that 
promote themselves really well on social media so people perform much better so you have to to um to to think who is going to be that will represent us, uh, how we present ourselves, what are our goals, uh, who do we want to meet there. Uh, you have to, to position yourself um, as everywhere on social media. Uh, you have to decide on what topics uh, you want to discuss. Um, and very important, as I said before, is the partnership. Uh, with whom do you work? Who do you take on your stage? Yeah, and um, of course, it is very important to have the courage to um, to just go and try it. Go and try it. It's easy. It's it's fun, and 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 you can learn a lot while you're uh, doing it. So I was also afraid at the beginning. Oh my God, if I do some, if I do something wrong, <laughs> but uh, uh, there is nothing wrong you can do. It's just it can be yourself you you can find a lot of tutorial on how to use the clubhouse app uh, uh on 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 youtube this is only one but uh, uh you can find a lot of information about that and uh, uh this is a little bit of information about myself and my services uh i'm doing uh marketing and communication consulting events and study tours training reports surveys white papers and business development if you're interested we can talk about that later and um here are my contacts I hope you took something from uh, my presentation. I'm here with you for the uh, rest of the um, uh, um, session and Thanks, look Joanna. forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was super interesting. And um, as a as an Android user, you know, I I'm not cool enough to be in the clubhouse yet. Um, sure. But I, I hope I, it looks fascinating, and, and I hope to I hope to join soon. So yeah, let's. Um, I'm going to ask Robert to come into the session. So, Joanna, do you want to stop sharing your your video and, and sound, and and let's bring Robert in. So, Robert, if you're ready to share your video um, and uh, come into the session. Uh, Robert is going to uh, talk to us about TikTok um, and while we're waiting for him I'll, I'll just uh, uh, you know give you some initial thoughts that I think what's super interesting about podcasting and Clubhouse is you still have to have access to information via a mobile phone and uh, internet so I mean I think this has we'll probably discuss this coming up in the in the in the in the chat coming up about about access robert are you with us yes here you are coming in hello good morning to you in berlin um can i just hello. check your sound hello everyone hello there you go you're with us and you're ready to tell us that TikTok is more than just silly dances and funny <laughs> cat videos <laughs> so Fantastic. if you were wonderful can you see my screen yes it's all perfect we're ready to go thank you Excellent. Thanks so much, Alison Ann and Zenyu, for inviting me. I'm excited to speak in the new ISC Communications Network, uh, presenting the Global Young Academy here, where I'm a member. Our uh, vision is to give a voice to young scientists to make science inclusive for all and science for the future. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the wonderful world of science communication on TikTok with a heavy emphasis on the communication part. And um, I, I think aspects of this are important if you want to understand the future of science communication and maybe future phases of science. TikTok is powerful for commu science communication because of various dimensions, which I'm going to go through in the presentation. Um, unprecedented reach, new digital tools, different forms of interaction, um, uh, a really va high value of individual authenticity which makes it harder for organizations i'm going to go into that a little bit and um, you see science is much more diverse than in possibly other channels so um my invitation to you is just following um the invitation from joanna um really is to start experimenting so the reach of TikTok is unprecedented in the sense that there is um, the mixture between a mysterious but powerful algorithm, and I can go into how it works uh, later, that's coupled with more than a billion active users worldwide, which creates uh, an opportunity for uh, communicating scientists such as myself to post something and then wake up to 100,000 views with, without having any followers. 
So the kind of the organic reach of that platform is particularly high. So how is spending time on this short form video platform useful for us as scientists or us as science organizations? Taking one step back, it's important to, to know what TikTok really offers and maybe in the future apps like TikTok. I know that Instagram is uh, with Reels and, and YouTube with Shorts is trying to take over some aspects of TikTok. But what TikTok really brought is me a new powerful video ed editing software to the mobile phone of every user um, offering creative filters using artificial intelligence based on a huge library or music library that can make everyone into a into a content producer within seconds and for the world of science that means that we have people like max for science who have uh, hundreds of thousands of um, followers introducing them to the wonderful world of science um, it also leads to you watching and scrolling for hours but there's actually indication that this TikTok platform isn't just for uh, young kids and, and silly dances. Um, there are lots and lots of scientists already on there and there's some initial data on that. So people are watching, people are listening from our community as well. Um, I talk about um, new digital tools, but it's really about the new types of interaction that you find on TikTok. There's some um, initial research on that. So I, I post here a working paper from, um, from Jing Sen and colleagues from the Global Young Academy um, who figure that right now, much of content that has the tag science on TikTok is dominated by STEM. Uh, it's mostly about showing experiments, experimental setting, and it's from a science studies perspective, quite uncritical about science, not really much reflecting about the role of science in society. But I would say increasingly, this is my thesis, there's a more egalitarian public engagement model. It's becoming much easier for individual scientists to interact with everyone and aided by these new, um, new applications that the uh, software brings. And maybe uh, if you're into theory, then this is really showing science in the making. So how, not just the outcome of science, but how science is done. At least there's the potential for that and it's increasingly used by an increasing number of diverse people. So um, I'm gonna introduce you to some uh, TikTokers and um, the, you can all find them in the presentation which is uploaded. Um, this is building trust in science, uh, showing the process, not just the outcome. You see a, um, an, uh, an account from Lab Shenanigans, someone who you know shows how science is done behind the scene in a very funny way. You have lots of individual creators that talk about statistics, astrophysics, different aspects of social scientists, lots of um, uh, people talking about COVID misinformation, debunking COVID myths and so on, lots of environmental myths and uh, sustainability scientists on TikTok. Um, and the list goes on, I couldn't fit it all on one slide. Um, they talk about you know, how, how does uh, peer review work? How does open science work? What does it mean to be black in science? how to, when to face, people are facing racism, sexism, and so on. People are openly and honestly speaking about science, individual scientists. It shows that um, on this short form video platform, people come to be entertained, but also to make personal connections. So authenticity and experimentation are showing, um, it, it's shown that the authenticity and experimentation is valued above everything else. Um, that means for creators that there are low threshold forms of engagement possible. You don't need to have amazing setups to have hundred thousands of views. Um, you can just do it with very little time and equipment and budget. But uh, as any uh, good, good scientist would do, I also have a list of limitations. So isn't directly useful for research purposes. Uh, speaking as a scientist, I don't really find out new facts about the world or new research there. Um, and that's different to say Twitter, where if you're not on Twitter, you can't really follow much of the uh, disciplinary debate because many of the working papers are launched there first before they are anywhere else. Likewise, there's less of a networking effect which you would have on, on LinkedIn. And there's obviously a range of different um, issues connected to any social media platform that works in our attention economy where videos that are crass and outrageous garner more views than, you know, subtle, complex thoughts. But they, they're they still creators that are visible with complex and interesting and non-crass um, videos. But there are, of course, data privacy issues, issues of censorship, surveillance. Um, it's not very accessible. Um, 
and as as everywhere on social media the the comment section is racist sexist and you know lots of regulation is is needed there there's a specific problem from the perspective of us from a global organization we're not active on on um on TikTok as an organization, but as individual, as many of our individuals are, um, that there's a regional bias of the algorithm. The first kind of 10 people that your new video is shown is usually people around you, and that makes global reach of science hard, I think. There's also a Western bias of content, mostly from, from global, global North and from the West that you see content. Now, what about science organizations? How could they use TikTok? Um, just like uh, Jonas said, um, with these new platforms, it's it's uh, it's about authenticity, and there's only very few organizations that are authentic or that can present themselves as a kind of authentic collective. So there's only some exceptions like the Washington Post or NPR who wish to use specific individuals um, who then have a TikTok profile who are very funny and entertaining. Um, but people don't come to TikTok to learn about science. They expect entertainment. So they come for communication and then stay for the science. So that, that's how it could be used. So um, you can cross post just like, like Anand said, you, you can use things that you already have and post it on, on TikTok and see how it works out. That's actually a nice strategy. Just post a couple of short clips and see if they go through the roof and if they garner lots of attention, that's a nice extra thing to have without lots of cost. Um, but in all in all, I would specifically encourage your and the, your members to um, to spend time on TikTok, not just producing, but also consuming. Consuming social media is also a form of science communication. Need, the, there's a need to understand better new ways of how we actually communicate in the world and how the next generation communicates. And this can only be done by immersion and experience. So please download the TikTok app. And so you'll be ready for the next uh, new app once TikTok is, is gone. Um, so it's a really, I think there's a value in spending time actually consuming uh, social media on your work time if you're a scientist or you, if you're a press officer to understand these new modes of communication and then apply the insights elsewhere if you're not already doing that. So lastly, um, let me finish on some more kind of provo provocative um, thesis. I think TikTok is a chance to review science communication as also being about quantity. I think too often um, quantity is a dirty word in science communication. When the uh, world around us is about quantity and, um, uh, and, and attention economy it doesn't mean dumbing down uh, or, or content at all. And there's, of course, different platforms have different purposes and, and so on. You will never get the, the depth of a YouTube uh, video, long form YouTube video on TikTok, but you are available for engagement from communication. You can quickly and directly react to people and that's a high value. You can also engage in story sharing, not just storytelling. So it's a much more level playing, playing field, eye, eye level communication mode that's, um, that's starting on TikTok, which I much appreciate from a and lastly, um, it's a realization that to improve SciComm, we need to consume content first. And maybe while doing that, we see some faces of the future of science. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited to um, to talk with you in the Q&A and later on the networking part. Thanks Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Robert. And I mean, you're looking at someone who's downloaded TikTok onto my phone and then deleted it and then put it back and then deleted it. So you've convinced me that I need to perhaps uh, be a be more of a social media consumer rather than think about social media as, as time wasting, which sometimes I do. So you've changed my mind. I'm just going to put into the the chat a YouTube video I found of a, of a scientist debunking myths um, because I don't have TikTok. This is how I've I found it. Can I ask Joanna and uh, Anan to, to share their videos? So let's have the four of us on so we can start a, a conversation. Um, so Joanna and here they are, Anand and, and bringing in Joanna. Wonderful. So look, I've just found today's discussion uh, exciting and absolutely on the new frontiers of, of science communication. So I'm, I'm really thrilled that we've, we've had this discussion and I hope that our, our, our viewers um, have been, are, are going to, to start thinking about the questions that they want to ask you. So if you would like to ask your question, you can ask it in the chat or in fact, I can bring you in and you can share your video and your, uh, and your, audio and we can bring you into the session. 
I'm going to start by giving out a challenge. And one of the challenges I'm giving you is, you know, we've got some very big global crises on at the moment. We're in a global pandemic. We have uh, climate change. We have cascading crises around biodiversity loss and things like that. So for us, open science and the ability to to talk with with the general public but also to ensure Robert you talked about this about one of the limitations about the algorithms um, I want to give you a challenge how can we you know link in clubhouse podcasting TikTok other other ways of discussing how can we make it completely open how can we ensure that that people have uh, access to, to all of these new frontiers and that as science communicators we're not falling uh, prey to just speaking to a similar group or in fact just hearing from a similar group. Um, Anan, let's start with you and then I'd like to hear from you Anna and then we'll go back to Robert. So Anan, what, what do you think about the question that I've posed and, and uh, you know because podcasting you know, I love radio. I, I, I think it's an amazing uh, medium um, and podcasting is almost like radio over broadband. So, so how, do we, how do we deal with bringing in uh, bigger audiences and hearing from, from critical voices or marginalised voices? Mm. Yeah, I think that there can definitely be a risk with podcasting that you just end up, you know, preaching to the choir, you know, you're kind of, you know, broadcasting to the sort of whatever metropolitan elite or whatever about something that you think is interesting but um i think that i mean on on some of the shows that i work with it's all about kind of including voices from parts of the world um that aren't just you know here and also you know um going to so what we do on crowd science when we were allowed to travel is we would actually go to countries um that, that don't that sort of serve the world services audience so we'd go to countries in africa and in asia and talk to scientists there you know there's so much other science out there rather than just the kind of big names that exist in, in you know, successful institutions. And I think you need to do both. Obviously, you want to talk about, you know, world class research, but also, you know, you want to talk to scientists who maybe don't have a platform yet, but are really, really, you know, engaging and working on new kinds of research. And also about research is going to is going to directly affect people that are living in those areas. Right. You, you know, you want to kind of not just report on and science is happening here, but science is going to affect, you know, potentially your listener in Bangladesh or whatever it is that you're mm. trying to do. Joanna, let's um, hear from you. And particularly, you know, I'm interested in how Clubhouse can, you know, we can hear marginalised voices because right now, obviously, it's quite exclusive. You need an invite, you need an iPhone. That yeah. in itself is quite an expensive, uh, you know, uh, piece of kit yeah. that you need. So so what are your views on on the, the evolution of Clubhouse and how we can make it? Uh, well, and should we? That's a question. I think, I think definitely you, you should. <laughs> I think science belongs there. It, it, it is very important. So what, what I'm thinking about, uh, I'm doing a lot of cross-industry innovation. So I'm bringing people together from different areas. And what I noticed is when you address somebody that it's not your bunch of people, you have to learn their language. Yeah. Um, so you have to learn to speak their language. When I'm taking customers from one market to the other, we take a look. What are they interested in? What are the words that they use? So if you want to to have a scientist, a conversation with um, with people like me <laughs> that, uh, that are uh, uh, like humanists, um, of course, you will have to address them in another way. Yeah, so maybe there are things that I cannot understand, but you surely can find words to explain things uh, that uh, are complicated to me. I mean, uh, <laughs> so he was able to, to explain something very complex in, 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 in quite simple words. So that is what uh, maybe science should do. It's really, I think it's extremely necessary to use the words of the people that are non-scientists to, 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 to make, make the science world more um, available. To, to us. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> so on Clubhouse, I, I cannot tell you what is the, the future of, of Clubhouse, but it's definitely worth uh, joining and experimenting with it. It's, it's very enriching. 
And I think, Joanna, there's a space, I mean, in your world, which is very much about marketing and, and news media, there's absolutely space for more science communication and news media to be, to be talking. And, and, and maybe that's something that, you know, we need to consider moving forward, um, particularly, you know, maybe that's a place where we need to set up a clubhouse in the future. Robert, I'm, I'm interested, I mean, I mean, you did touch on this in terms of, of Western bias and algorithms. So what are your thoughts on, on, on this? I, I hope TikTok goes away and makes <gasps> room for, for something more inclusive. Um, so I think it's important to, to learn in the platform, but um, that's precisely right. Um, we have many global um, members who in their context, you know, there's a huge issue of data injustice where mm -hmm. people pay mm -hmm. a lot um, and can't actually participate in many of the live streamed um, aspects and platforms that are, you know, mostly in time zones in, in, in in the West and so on, and also it's it's difficult and if, to access. So, I'd rather we invest as organizations in more accessible platforms and take all we can and learn from the. Access. However, um, and and in particular, um, you might know that. Uh, well, actually, I gave a talk in virtually in India about TikTok, and one week later, it was banned in India. No no correlation there, but um, it it just shows how from one day to the next, huge media platforms can basically exclude. Um, you know, for geopolitical reasons, people from from certain platforms. So I think as science organizations, we need to think how we are less reliant on specific big players. Um, we use the tech, but how can we be resilient and not reliant on, on these exclusionary platforms? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the International Science Council is, is, is you know, one of our key projects is, is, is our digital future and making sure that there is democracy and fairness in our digital future. And, and you've, you've talked about that digital divide. Um, and in fact, um, I, I don't know if Erin, you wanted to share your, your video and your, your, your welcome or I can ask the question for you. So um, Erin is um, from, from one of our members, um, the Organisation for Women in Science um, for the Developing Worlds. And Erin has a practical question for you, Anand, um, which is what are your suggestions about how to identify and approach existing podcasts? Oh, here she is. Hi, Erin. Hello. <laughs> Great, you can ask your question. Welcome. Okay, sure. Um, so thank you, everybody. I thought all, all three presentations were really, really interesting. And as Alison said, definitely on new frontiers that we are not quite exploring yet at OST, but I'm intrigued now. Um, so my, yeah, my question was for Anand, um, which was uh, if we're not in a position, let's say to produce our own podcast, uh, but we would be interested in uh, working with another organization to, to maybe have like some of our members or our fellows featured on on their podcast do you have any advice for how to identify the right podcast to approach and how to go about pitching to them yeah i i guess it depends whether you're kind of looking to sort of formally pitch your ideas to like a you know a broadcaster and say you know we've got this really really great story we think it could be a powerful you know thing for you to um to publish on your on your podcast or whether it's sort of more informal i think if you're kind of looking to just approach another podcast that's like you know not massive but like you know has is successful in your sort of space then um i guess in terms of identifying what would be good um you know if, if you like the podcast and it is doing well then that's probably a good sign um and i think a lot i mean i would say that you know uh, when you when a podcast is just made by like a small team and they have autonomy they have the flexibility to say okay well you know in a month's time we'll kind of interrupt our normal release schedule and we'll do a collaboration or we'll kind of work with, with another group kind of down the line so yeah i don't really know how you'd go about as an organization like you work for approaching a big broadcaster um but i think just i'm i'm jay i think just just approaching the the people that are making it and um, directly i think is often really fruitful i mean I, i've when i was working at the royal institution we would just um yeah i would just email people that were working at, at places or youtubers that i thought were doing really good work and just say hey do you want to do something together and i think people are actually quite receptive to that thanks anand and and thanks erin for your question and, and i'm going to put out a challenge so so uh Genia is, uh, you know, as part of the ISC communications network, the SciComs communications network, we want to amplify 
our member science stories and I've seen members on here from crystal crystallography and uh, who else did I see there was someone from an astronomy organization from the Arab Council of Social Sciences space aeronomy I mean we've got interesting scientific organizations on here um, and the ISC did start our own uh, ISC podcast series and uh, to help us we we started off by investing a small amount of money um, I mean not everyone has access to uh, 2,000 euros but that's the investment that we put in at the beginning um, I'm going to put in an interesting uh, New York Times article but we actually worked with a very small organization called Ashanta Podcasting and they helped us to get started they helped us to get our jingle together she gave us some some ideas on how to what we, we bought the wrong microphone we bought the wrong microphone and we had to send it back and buy a different microphone so so that was one of the mistakes we made a very classic kind of error um, but I'm going to put a challenge out to everyone on there you know let's work together the ISC we have a podcast uh, ability we have microphones we, we, we've done an initial series around women in science we're about to do another one on refugee scientists um, and again that's working um, with partners on that um, you know let's let's work together and and find uh, synergies as part of this new psychoms network that we're creating to, to put forward our science you know maybe Robert will be ready to do something on TikTok and and Joanna when when Clubhouse is ready to to welcome Android you know I'd love for us to think about ways that we can we can have a science uh, a science clubhouse um, and again you know looking at influences and issues like that um, Dwee Gultam let's quickly come into you because I look I'm I know that it's 11 uh, we, we, we've gone to the full hour so can we just uh, Dwee Gultam do you want to share your video and come in so just share your video on the top of the screen or I can ask it for you Okay, Dwyer's not coming in. So let's. So the question is for Robert. TikTok has a very short time span, which is approximately fifteen to sixty seconds. Do you have any strategies to address the challenge of squeezing years of research into a fifteen sec to sixty second TikTok content? Thanks. Uh, I guess as a researcher, no amount of uh, limitation is uh, is. Uh, is a is a constraint because we love talking uh, we love talking research in whatever form um i think it's ab about continuous engagement and being on the platform and being able to respond to questions then you can do that in different installations of of uh, 15 16 30 seconds um lizzie do you want to come in lizzie's um our science of uh, our communications officer senior communications officer come in lizzie and ask your question Oh, she's not coming in. So she's a question for she, oh, here she is. Hi, Lizzie. Good morning. Hi there. Um, thanks for bringing me in. Uh, so in all of the presentations, one thing that really came out strongly for me was the importance of authenticity and kind of real people speaking um, in these uh, different spaces that's something of a challenge for people like us who work as uh, communications officers in, in bigger organizations and um, i was wondering if you have ideas on who's doing this well right now and where we can start thinking about how to, how to get that kind of authentic genuine voice out in these spaces Um, let's this is a nice way to close the discussion actually thank you Lizzie this is a nice way to close the discussion and and allow people to to finish this session and if they have time to, to do some networking and to keep chatting in the session space so um, Joanna let's go to you and 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 kind of round up this discussion and, and and talk about the importance of authenticity as we as we as we finish up I've lost your sound, I think, Joanna. Joanna, can you refresh and come yeah. back in? Yeah. The question is, is one of the, the um, best questions to, to ask. Oh. Oh. 
Can't. Maybe. Yes, we can hear you, Joanna. Not yes, so we can so hear if you. If you can talk, <laughs> there's topic. Wonderful. Uh, so um, I would recommend what I see in, in uh, businesses uh, when they do it good. They have internal people, mm -hmm. employees that are acting as influencer. It can be uh, the social CEO. Uh, it can be uh, a colleague in the communication department. It can be the scientist itself, but there must be people that love to exchange with other people. Yeah. So they have to have fun in doing it, not doing it just for uh, because they have to do it. So this is important. Find your influencer, and your influencer Great. is not only savvy, Great but has suggestion. fun Robert? doing it, exchanging with others. It's it's tricky. Um, I I guess actually. I would love to see more videos, personal videos from from staff in different science organizations because you have skills about, you know, running digital events um, and of course many many other aspects. I, I would love to see more of this. Um, and yeah, again, it's it's all via via individuals, organizations as a whole. I think it's very difficult to have a top down, for example, TikTok strategy and social media that usually doesn't work. Just encourage individuals working for you, interns. Um, student assistance, something like that, and, and experiment. And probably ask the interns because they're going to be of a generation that are that are media savvy and, and, are, and, are, and are doing TikTok and, and other things like that. Anand, let's hear from you. I would agree, you know, you, you've got this trade off between being a big organization and kind of, you know, you, you want the cult of personality, you want kind of one person that's um, that's really kind of engaging. So we had a guy when I was at the RI who was, we just kind of put, he was a technician, we just put him in front of the camera and he was just a, an instant hit. People loved him. Um, and we got, we, our video channel basically grew a lot because of him, but then he left. Um, and so then, you know, he obviously, if he decided to launch his own channel, he would take those people kind of with him. So there is a trade off. I think mm. basically you just have to, you have to allow people to experiment and to kind of be themselves. Um, and yeah, that's the only way. I, you, sounds like a cliche, but you can't fake authenticity. So you, you need to you need to allow people to kind of express themselves and, and and do things that they they're interested in. Yeah, and Edwards just put in the the chat that that uh, that he encourages his interns to TikTok, and they get tens of thousands of views. Um, so maybe Edward, you can remind us which uh, organisation you're with. I, I lo I've loved this. This is why we call this knowledge sharing. Um, because, uh, you know, we have all of these wonderful ideas. Can I, we'll be repeating this again tomorrow in a, in a time zone for, for the Americas. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, if you, if you want to, uh, if you, if you've enjoyed this and you want to encourage people who might have missed today to, to join tomorrow's yeah. session, that would be wonderful. Um, can I thank our guest speakers, um, very much for, for their time today. It has been, frankly, one of the most, uh, engaging, uh, knowledge sharing sessions that, uh, we've run so far. And, uh, I hope that we can continue the discussion in the networking. Um, Jenny or Anne, perhaps you'd like to come on and just give people instructions about what we should do in order, I'm assuming now that we would leave the networking session and we would go into, uh, we would leave this session and we would go into networking. Exactly. I will post the link in the chat in a second. So we invite you all to join us for networking now. We'll, we'll click the button right away um, after the close of the session. So it's on the left hand side on your navigation bar. Networking says has a red sign now uh, because we're slightly over time. So if you all click on there and then you can be matched, uh, it, it matches you randomly with a networking partner. So with one of uh, you know the people online in this event at the moment. And then it's a preset uh, timer to chat for a few minutes and then it um, expires and you you click the button again and you're matched with another person. So a really great way to meet new people, start new conversations. And then uh, after about half, 20 minutes, we meet back in the sessions area if you like to uh, continue the, the discussion on the three topics or beyond. So yes, and that would be, that would just be unguided. So it'd actually be like a 
you know, like a, a party atmosphere, if you like. Um, for our three guests, um, I know that you're busy people. We would love for you to stay in network, but equally we know that if you have um, other important um, aspects of your day to get on with, well, we recognise that. So I hope to meet some of our members in the, in the networking. Thank you all for joining us um, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.